part of being in any scientific field is coming across things that cannot be explained and trying to find that explanation. That's how our understanding of the world around us develops. But there are just some mysterious cases that have left experts baffled. There's a small town in Texas known as Aurora, which is just north of Dallas. The small town has obtained quite the name for itself after a supposed UFO sighting was documented in the area back in 1897. A cigar-shaped flying object was spotted by numerous locals before it crashed into a nearby village, killing its pilot instantly. Additionally, a local graveyard claims to have the pilot's body buried somewhere on its premises, though it allegedly has no headstone due to it being stolen in the 70s. According to legend, the object was seen just before it crashed into a windmill, shattering into countless pieces. The disfigured body of the pilot was then taken and given a Christian burial, with the remaining pieces of the ship being tossed into a nearby well. The story has gone largely unconfirmed, though the story of the Aurora UFO is now one nearly as popular as the supposed Roswell crash of the early 1900s. 428 at Ohio State University is unavailable to students and most workers. It's been boarded up and closed due to an exceptionally high number of reports of paranormal activity. People say that they felt poltergeist activity, witnessed objects flying across the room, doors that open and shut by themselves, and even dark shadows appearing and disappearing without explanation. However, one of the most interesting aspects of the room is the wooden face of a demon that appears on the door. The door has been replaced countless times, though the face will return each time without incident. The apparition is known to be largely benign and even playful. However, it supposedly belongs to the spirit of a student who took his own life in the room years ago. The story is one of the most popular ghost stories spread around on the OSU campus. A group of students from South Carolina University were walking nearby a theater back in the 1940s when they thought they spotted a gray-faced man wearing a silver suit. They followed the man for a short ways before he ultimately disappeared by lifting a manhole cover and fleeing into the sewer system. The students dubbed the incident Sewer Man, but he wouldn't be seen again until years later. In April of 1950, a policeman discovered a man dressed in silver near the remains of a series of mutilated chickens. The officer flashed his light towards the man only to find that he had a third eye located in the center of his forehead. The policeman ran to a squad car and called for backup, though by the time officers had arrived, he was gone. The man was seen once again later on in the 1960s by another group of students. Sewer Man, also known as Third Eye Man, has not been reported again since the 1990s. Some have suggested that the man could have been some sort of alien, while others say that he could have just had some sort of physical birth defect. Either way, Third Eye Man's existence remains one of the most quoted paranormal stories of South Carolina history. Netta Fornario was a writer who believed herself to be a magical healer. Born in London, she eventually moved to Scotland where she met her fate under wildly mysterious circumstances. Some say that her demise came at the hands of a psychic murderer, while others say that she may have been overburdened by a hostile spirit or even passed away due to simple heart failure. Leading up to her passing, she's known to have traveled to the island of Iona and made contact with several spirits. She continued doing this until November when her behavior rapidly changed. She soon packed her bags and traveled back to London where she informed a friend that she felt as though she'd been receiving telepathic messages from other worlds. All of her silver jewelry had strangely turned to black, and sometime the next day, Netta went missing. Her body was found the following Tuesday wearing nothing but a black cloak. Her skin was found to have been covered in tiny scratches with the soles of her feet being cut as if she'd been running over sharp gravel. Her cause of death was never determined as all the tiny cuts could not have allowed for enough blood loss for her to pass away naturally. Her body seemed to be in great shape other than this. Still to this day, her death has been unsolved. Since a very young age, a boy in India named Taranjit had been claiming that his real name was actually Satnam. He says that he had passed away in a previous life in a tragic accident near a village about 40 miles away. The boy was able to describe extreme details about his supposed past life, stating that he was a student of class 9 and had passed away from a bike crash in 1992. He stated that the school books he was carrying at the time got soaked in blood and that he had only had about $30 in his pocket at the time. Due to the boy's insistence in this, the father decided to investigate. The young boy's father then traveled to the nearby village and spoke with teachers at the local school, who confirmed that a student had in fact died in a very similar fashion. He was then directed to the boy's family, who confirmed the blood soaked books and the $30. The father then took a photo of Satnam back to his son, who was able to correctly identify him. To take things one step further, investigators 
Investigators became involved in the matter and even they concluded that the boy's story was shockingly similar to the real life occurrence, and even found that the young boy's handwriting was almost identical to Sat Nam's. While the strange story technically remains a mystery to this day, this boy certainly does seem to have genuine information about a past life. The Codex Gigas is the world's largest medieval manuscript to have ever been discovered. In more recent years, the book has been known under the pseudonym Devil's Bible, due to the book's rather famous full-page illustration of the devil. It's believed to have been created sometime around the 13th century in Bohemia. It contains a complete version of the Catholic Church's Bible, which is popularized in the 16th century. The book contains both Old and New Testaments, though in between the two are a group of additional texts not typically found in modern translations of the Bible, including additional chapters known as the Antiquities of the Jews, the Judean War, and St. Isidore's Encyclopedia, and more. According to many, the book is said to have been written by a single monk known as Herman the Recluse, with most of the work being conducted in a monastery in the Czech Republic. The monastery was destroyed sometime around the 15th century, and records in the Codex seem to end in the year 1229. According to legend, the monk who wrote the Codex made a deal with the devil in order to complete it. The monk allegedly broke his vow with the devil, and is said to currently be in eternal torment because of this. The exact story claims that the monk promised the local monastery that he would create a book containing all the world's human knowledge, if they would let him live as a free man. However, the monastery requested that the book be written in a single day. The man then sold his soul to Lucifer in order to fulfill this promise, though later turned his back on it. According to historians, whether the legend is true or not, it has been confirmed that the book was written by a single person within an extremely small window of time. The book is also made from 160 animal skins and requires two full-grown men just to lift it. To this day, all of the book remains intact aside from 12 missing pages. The content of these pages has never been determined and it's unclear why the pages would have been removed in the first place. Some have theorized that these pages could have contained secret satanic texts or even instructions on how to conjure up the devil himself. Regardless, the real mystery is why the book would have been written in the first place, as there existed multiple other copies of the Latin Bible at the time and also how a single person wrote the book in such a small window of time. Scholars have absolutely no idea, and for now, the tale remains a mystery. The Sumerian King's List is the name given to a large tablet created by the Sumerians, detailing all of the Sumerian kings as well as loads of personal information about them, including their time and power, dynasties, and locations of kingship. Sumerians believed that the power of being a king or queen was handed down by the gods. One of the strangest things about this tablet is that some of the early in Sumerian kings have impossibly long years of power. For example, Nani of the Yur dynasty ruled for about 120 years. Hadanish of the Hazamasi dynasty ruled for 360 years. Several other rulers of the Kish dynasty are listed as ruling for 360 years as well. Others are listed for holding power for well over a millennium, and in some cases over 40,000 years. Historians are unsure of exactly how these people could have lived such long lives, especially while maintaining their kingship. Many religiously minded individuals have suggested that people simply lived longer back then, though science has yet to show us exactly how this would have been possible. Aside from the theory that our bodies were likely stronger back then, our DNA more pure, and many illnesses that would kill us today simply didn't exist back then. To this day, the tablet is still baffling to many historians, and the true history of these rulers remains a mystery. Easter Island is home to seemingly countless unsolved mysteries, though one that's particularly interesting is in regards to a series of writings or drawings known as the Rongo Rongo Writings. These drawings were first discovered in the 19th century and appeared to be an early form of historical documentation using only pictures, similar to the Egyptian hieroglyphs. To this day, however, the Rongo Rongo writings have never been deciphered, and historians are baffled as to what stories they may actually tell. Numerous attempts to decipher the drawings have been made over the last hundred years or so, though virtually no progress has actually been made. Some have suggested that the writings could simply be a calendar, though others believe that it could be something more historically relevant, such as a genealogy. Another theory is that the writing could be entirely independent, and if this proves to be correct, these drawings could be some of the earliest independent drawings in human history. According to one scholar, Eugene Urod, 
The writings could be from the year 1200. They feature similar designs to other religious material found in the area around the same time period, though no one knows what these religious symbols mean. The drawings appear to have been carved into wood using obsidian or even a shark's tooth, though again they don't really make much sense at all, at least not to the modern mind. Some have theorized that the tablets were placed on Easter Island by aliens, considering the abundance of other seemingly extraterrestrial activity that took place on the island, though for now the writings simply remain a mystery. In the northern area of Laos, a strange and unidentified collection of circular containers were found on the countryside. The containers are believed to be at least 2,000 years old, and most historians' best guess is that they're some sort of jars and that they've been involved with a funeral service, though this is a common estimation by historians that rarely proves to be true. All throughout history, researchers suggest that various historically significant items posed as tombs, temples, or other funeral-related items. The pyramids of Egypt are a great example of this. Historians portray ancient civilizations as being boring, death-obsessed individuals, having seemingly no purpose in their lives other than to fantasize their own deaths or mourn the deaths of others. However, this has almost always proved to be false, and oftentimes these mysterious devices have turned out to be some sort of incredible ancient technology, or served a purpose that modern society simply can't even fathom, such as astrological research or even simple day-to-day -day tasks. But that's a video for another time. This series of jars have more recently been known simply as the Plain of Jars, and were constructed of sandstone weighing at least a ton each. Many of the cylinders were damaged by gunfire or explosions, as they reside near the place where the American Secret War was carried out. Today, visitors are not allowed to come near the jars as they're far too fragile. The site in which they're located is also riddled with bombs and landmines that have yet to be deactivated from the war. The Sumer people, also known as the Sumerian, are believed by many to be the earliest known human civilization to have ever lived. They're widely recognized due to their exceptionally high skill level in areas such as agriculture and writing. The Sumerians are believed to have settled in what we now know as Iraq back in 5500 BC. One of the most shocking facts about the Sumerians is that at one point, one of the most prominent Sumerian cities housed over 80,000 people, a number that was almost unheard of at the time. The Sumerians are believed to have built at least 12 different cities, usually consisting of metropolis-like structures and pyramid-like temples. Their homes are oftentimes constructed with marsh or makeshift bricks, with the plumbing system also believing to have been put into place. According to Sumerian historical documents, these settlements would have been ruled by one of many kings mentioned on the king's list, which we spoke of a moment ago. What's quite interesting though is that one of these rulers is actually believed to have been a woman. Even in 2019, the idea of a woman leading a country is somewhat controversial, though I'll never understand why. However, the Sumerians were successfully being ruled by a woman way back in the year 2500 BC. The Sumerians are also credited as possibly being the first to have developed a type of beer, in addition to inventing the wheel, plow, literature, and even law. But more importantly, the beer they made appears to have been made from barley, though the exact technique for this is relatively unknown. They're known to have drank the beer through a special filtration straw, with the drink allegedly being highly nutritious and was said to have brought joy to all. Though one of the strangest mysteries of the Sumerians is that they took virtually no credit for all of their inventions and engineering feats. They literally invented the wheel, yet no one took credit for it. Rather, all of their credit was passed on to three men who they claimed descended from the skies. These three beings can be seen in seemingly countless Sumerian texts and drawings, and they're said to have been of the highest intelligence, with some historians claiming that these mysterious beings could have even bred with the Sumerians, creating modern humans. In fact, certain Sumerian statues seem to depict Neanderthals, which are essentially less evolved forms of humans. DNA evidence also seems to indicate that Sumerians may have originally been Neanderthals themselves, though for some unknown reason, they seem to have evolved into modern humans almost literally overnight. Many have pointed to some sort of divine intervention, proposing that these three mysterious beings could have been angels or gods to interbred with humans in order to create a more advanced species. The discovery has baffled scientists and historians for decades, and no one can seem to figure out how a race of people evolved so quickly, invented so many modern technologies, and thrived for so long, yet never took credit for any of their own discoveries. Rather, insisting that all of their work and technological advancement was carried out by three mysterious men who floated down from the heavens. Go's mother had been missing for almost five years when he found her in the most unexpected of places, a McDonald's. In November of 2015, 
Associated Press ran a story about an elderly homeless woman who passed away at a 24-hour McDonald's in Hong Kong. The woman had been slumped over at her table for hours before customers and staff tried to wake her, only to find her cold and unresponsive. The story highlighted a growing trend in Hong Kong, homeless people seeking refuge at the restaurants. Surprisingly, the staff were often accommodating, closing off part of the restaurant where these Mick refugees slept rather than forcing them back out onto the street. Associated Press interviewed one of the people planning to spend the night at a restaurant, 60-year-old Mary Xiao. With the story making it to international news sites and outlets, it was eventually found by Edward, who recognized the woman as his own mother. Mary had disappeared in February of 2011. She was a Singaporean woman who'd been abandoned as a baby on the steps of a church. After having been found by passers-by, she was unofficially adopted. Having no adoption papers wasn't an issue for going to school or eventually getting married, but it did mean when her adoptive parents passed away, she was denied access to their savings. Mary was a widow at this point, her husband having passed away from a heart attack. It was in the early 2000s that she met the people who would eventually lure her to China. Mary met the young woman at church and the two quickly became friends. The unnamed woman managed to convince Mary to marry a Chinese national named Li Xiren, who she claimed was her uncle. They were married in 2008, but less than six months later, Li had disappeared. Still, Mary remained friends with the woman and was pressured into selling her home and investing money in the friend's business back in China. Mary eventually sold everything she owned and went to China to invest everything in the business. It was only after arriving and handing over most of her money that she discovered it had all been an extremely long scam. Without any money and ashamed for having fallen for the trick, Mary was left stranded in China. She made ends meet as a street sweeper and made her way to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, she found work in parallel trading bringing branded goods from the city to mainland China. It wasn't enough to rent a flat in the city though, and she found herself staying at the McDonald's. Mary had only started sleeping in the restaurants a few weeks before AP arrived to cover the story, having seen others doing the same thing and deciding to give it a go. When Edward saw his mother in the news, he went to Hong Kong to find her and brought her back home to Singapore. The Crime of Cuenca is a bizarre story of the disappearance of Jose Maria Grimaldos Lopez, who was missing for 16 years. Jose was a shepherd who worked on a farm in the province of Cuenca, Spain, at the turn of the 20th century. He was a relatively short man, and some sources claim he also had low intelligence. For this, he was ridiculed by his boss and co-workers, in particular the farm manager, Leon Sanchez, and security guard Gregorio Valero. Despite being in his late 20s, Jose was not romantically involved with anyone and lived with his parents in a nearby town. He would often tell them of the bullying that he suffered from his co-workers. Little did they know he had plans to put a stop to it. In August of 1910, Jose sold a number of sheep that he owned. He told friends and family he was going on a trip to a mud lagoon, some four kilometers outside of town. It was a popular bathing spot, as the mud was supposed to have healing properties, and Jose apparently wanted to get away from the torment of his day-to-day -day life. But after several weeks of not hearing from him, Jose's family grew concerned and filed the missing persons report. Given Jose had just sold his sheep, they feared someone might have attacked him to steal the money. Then a more sinister thought occurred. What if this wasn't a random attack? Having heard about all the bullying, Jose's family thought Leon Sanchez and Gregorio Valero were responsible for his disappearance. Twice the case was brought to court and the family accused the two of taking Jose's life and disposing of his body. Twice it was thrown out due to a lack of evidence. The family weren't going to give up though 
and the pair were arrested again in 1913. They were subjected to brutal treatment until they eventually confessed to taking Jose's life. For five years, they were held in prison before the trial began. Once the trial did get underway, evidence was contradictory. But as they both had confessed to the crime, the jury spent half an hour coming up with a guilty verdict. They were both sentenced to 18 years in prison. Eight years after the verdict was passed, the local priest received a strange letter from a neighboring town. The priest there was requesting the birth certificate of Jose Grimaldos as a man going by that name wished to get married. The priest either thought it was a cruel joke or a mistake, so he ignored the letter. Then the man himself, Jose, arrived in town to acquire the birth certificate in person. Officials and Jose's family were all astonished to discover this really was their missing relative. Jose had disappeared of his own accord and didn't realize he was considered missing and even deceased in his hometown. Leon and Gregorio were put on trial again and found innocent of the crime that had never been committed and those responsible for the miscarriage of justice were themselves put on trial. During his trial in 1980, the full extent of the horrific crimes committed by John Wayne Gacy became public knowledge. A profile of his typical victim was developed, young white men, often following a nomadic lifestyle, sometimes employed in Gacy's construction company. To the Hutton family, the description fit exactly with their missing relative, Robert Hutton. Robert had been missing since 1972. Shortly after graduating high school, he joined his sister and brother-in-law as they road-tripped across America. Robert found it easy to find work in construction wherever they went and was enjoying the nomadic lifestyle. But when they reached Colorado, he decided he wanted to stay. His sister and brother-in-law continued on their journey, leaving Robert behind. It was the last time anyone in his family would see him for decades. Robert's family filed a missing persons report in 1972, after he hadn't gotten back in contact with them. Little progress was made in the case, and when news of Gacy's crimes came to light, the family feared the worst. They guessed Robert would have continued hitchhiking and picking up construction work after leaving his sister, and it was possible he'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time and crossed paths with the criminal. Robert's parents believed their son had passed away, but his sister Edith was determined to find him. In the 1990s, Edith compiled a list of 400 men from across America, going by the name Robert, Rob, or Bob Hutton. She sent each of them a postcard explaining she was looking for her brother. None of them got back to her. She would also trawl through websites of John Doe's, unidentified men who had lost their lives, but none of them were her brother either. Finally, in 2011, the Cook County Sheriff's Department announced they were looking into the identity of Gacy's victims, and some of them had remained does for more than 30 years. Edith got in contact and sent a DNA sample to see if any of the victims could be confirmed as a relative. Unfortunately, for someone who just wanted answers at this point, None were a match, but detectives working the case decided to help Edith. They put Robert Hutton's information into a database to see if they could find any sign of him. Amazingly, they found what they were looking for. Robert was alive and well, living in Montana. He'd traveled a lot, not putting down roots for too long. For a while, he owned his own carpentry and construction company, but business slowed in 2008 and he was on the move again. He'd wanted to get in touch with his family, but had been unable to find any contact information for them. He assumed that they hadn't been looking for him, so he kept to himself. Robert was reunited with his father and sister. His mother had sadly already passed away, still thinking her son was one of Gacy's victims. Margie Prophet had always been eccentric. Even as a child, she said she felt like an alien, but didn't mind too much. In her eyes, some of the best scientists were misfits, and fitting in didn't matter as much to her as science. She
She was extremely intelligent, regularly testing grades above her age. She was the daughter of two Berkeley-trained engineers, and she went on to study at the university, though not before graduating from Harvard with a degree in political philosophy. At Berkeley, she studied physics. Then in 1994, she went to Seattle to study mathematics at the University of Washington. All the while, Margie was developing her own scientific theories. She was a well-respected scientist, even if her theories were radically different to anything anyone was talking about at the time. In 1993, she received the MacArthur Genius Grant for her out there theories and was described as evolution's it girl. She argued menstruation, allergies, and morning sickness had all developed to help get rid of the body's pathogens and carcinogens, and wrote a book on advice for pregnant women, which included not eating vegetables. In the early 2000s, Margie started to pull away from her friends and family. She cut off all contact with her mother, with whom she had been very close, for reasons her mother would never understand. She was still studying, but became easily frustrated with her co-workers and supervisors. Some that knew her said she was dealing with psychological problems that she was good at hiding. Margie's disappearance was slow, pulling away from people until sometime in 2005. It was discovered that no one knew where she was or what had happened to her. Margie's mother reported her missing and even hired a private investigator to try to locate her. Her online history stopped sometime around 2002, and there was no credit card information to follow. It was as if she'd simply ceased to exist. In 2012, a writer at the publication Psychology Today wrote about Margie's life, work, and disappearance. He had known Margie for a time when they were students and was fascinated by her work. When he looked her up years later, he was amazed to find no one knew where she was. The article was called The Mysterious Case of the Vanishing Genius. Those that knew Margie thought she'd either met with foul play, was in a care facility for a mental breakdown, or had disappeared to get away from the fame her theories had acquired. It would turn out to be none of these things. A few weeks after the Psychology Today article was published, the writer received an email from Margie's mother. Margie had gotten back in contact. Margie had been suffering with a condition that left her in severe physical pain. She didn't want to bother her mother with her problems and had quietly slipped away somewhere she thought would help her get better. The pain would explain why she was so short with those around her and any mental health problems people thought she might have. The pain didn't go away and Margie was unable to work She'd fallen into poverty and hadn't imagined anyone would go looking for her. She'd been shown the article about her disappearance and immediately contacted her mother, who was overjoyed to have Margie back in her life. Not every case of a missing person returning has a happy ending, as was the case with Brenda Heist. Heist made headlines in 2013 when she reappeared after 11 years. The Pennsylvanian mother of two had been considered legally deceased for over a decade and her case had been cold when she suddenly turned up in Florida. It was February of 2002 when friends and family last saw Heist. She was in the middle of a divorce from her husband, Lee Heist, and had applied for housing assistance. The application had been denied and Heist couldn't see how she was going to support herself and her two children. After dropping off her children at school, she went to a park and cried, according to Heist. That was when she met a group of drifters who invited her to join them as they hitchhiked down to Florida. Heist agreed and without a word to friends or family, vanished. Given their marital problems, suspicion fell on Lee. Of course, there was never any evidence he was responsible for her disappearance. But rumors swirled and neighbors wouldn't let their children play with the two heist kids. Lee and his children eventually adapted to life without Brenda. They had money problems and had to move into assisted housing. After she was declared legally deceased, Lee remarried and the children graduated high school. Their son went on to pursue a career in law enforcement. 
They expected they would never have answers as to what happened to their loved one. But their world was turned on its head again in April of 2013. According to Heist, she'd been homeless for most of the 11 years that she'd been living in Florida. At first, she'd lived under bridges and survived on food thrown out by restaurants. For a while, she'd lived in a camper van with a boyfriend. But when the relationship broke down, she ended up on the streets again. Under false names, she acquired a criminal record for theft and illegal substance use. It was as she answered one of these warrants for her arrest that she told police in Florida her real name, handing over Brenda Heist's ID. Police in Pennsylvania were contacted, and the Heist family was informed that she was still alive. By this point though, her daughter wanted nothing to do with the woman who had abandoned her. Lee Heist also now faced problems with the insurance company as he'd received a life insurance payout for Brenda. More suspicion was thrown onto her story when a woman in Florida came forward to say Brenda had lived with her for almost a year while working as a housekeeper. Brenda hadn't appeared homeless at the time, and the woman had no suspicion she'd been using illegal substances. It's likely the true story about what really happened in the 11 years Brenda was away from her family is not yet known. In 2016, a bizarre video began circulating around the internet, showing an apparent demonic possession of a woman in a supermarket. The video, titled Demonic Possession in Korea, quickly went viral, amassing thousands of views, and the internet was abuzz with theories and explanations behind the mysterious video. Online sleuths began questioning the authenticity of the video, and after doing a bit of digging, they found that the creepy CCTV footage had actually been captured in China, not Korea. But that still didn't give an explanation for what happened in the video. In the video, a middle-aged woman can be seen walking down the aisle, carrying items that she's taking to the checkout. As she reaches the middle of the aisle, something bizarre and unexplainable happens. The woman can be seen placing an item back on the shelf when all of the sudden, she becomes possessed by a demonic entity. She quickly drops all of her items and begins flailing and moving in a bizarre manner. Whatever had possessed the woman took over very quickly and forced her to the floor, shaking and moaning. Concerned shoppers rushed to the woman's aid, thinking that perhaps she was having a medical emergency. As a young woman kneels beside her to comfort her, the possessed woman lets out a terrifying scream. Other shoppers rush to the woman's aid, but they're met with the same horrified scream from the woman. No matter how hard they may try, the woman remains in the possessed trance-like state and is unable to communicate. One man was able to restrain her and perform a religious ceremony to banish the demon, which appeared to work momentarily. Then without warning, items around the shoppers begin to shake and the woman let out another scream. Finally, the woman calms down and is led away by the other shoppers. Some people believe that the clip is fake and that those in the video are actors, but nobody has ever come forward to claim responsibility for the clip, making this one of the scariest moments caught on CCTV. The first 24 hours of a missing person case are the most crucial, and as time ticks by, Law enforcement understands the risks and statistics when it comes to locating a missing person alive. Most missing person cases do not have a whole host of information to work with, let alone a CCTV footage of the person's last moments. However, for Carlicia Freeland Gaither, her chilling disappearance was captured on CCTV, and this footage led to her safe return. 22-year-old Carlicia Freeland Gaither failed to return home or make contact with her family on November 2nd, 2014, which was incredibly out of character for the young woman. Carlicia worked as a nurse and dedicated her life to saving others and caring for those who wouldn't care for themselves. On the evening of November 2nd, 2014, Carlicia had just spent the evening visiting her godson, and as she got off the bus and walked to her home, she was abducted from the street. CCTV footage shows Carlicia walking near the 5400 block of Green Street 
when an unknown man grabs her by the hand and tries to pull her into his Ford Taurus. Carlicia fought back but was overpowered by the man, who bundled her into his car and sped off into the night. The CCTV footage was discovered when investigators began retracing Carlicia's last steps. And that's when they made the chilling discovery. Carlicia had given her abductor her bank card in hopes that it would create a paper trail back to her. And luckily, it worked. Along with bank records and CCTV images, the Philadelphia police were able to track the registration of the car from the footage and found that it belonged to 37-year-old Delvin Barnes. Once they had a name, they set about looking for Barnes, and just two days later, they found him and Carlicia in Maryland. Carlicia's family praised the Philadelphia police's efforts in finding her, with Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey also commending the efforts of the police force. Ramsey told 6ABC, quote, The detective on this case recovered the video very quickly, got the FBI involved right away, and we started really running on this hard from the beginning. Had it not been for the chilling CCTV footage, Carlicia's case may have had a very different outcome. The case of Terry Missy Bevers has haunted Texas for over five years. And even with the existence of creepy CCTV footage, investigators are still no closer to solving the mystery once and for all. 45-year-old Missy Bevers was well-loved by the local community in Red Oak, Texas, and was well-known for her fitness classes at the Creekside Church of Christ. On April 18, 2016, Missy arrived at the church at 4.18 a.m. and was preparing to set up the hall for a class she was leading at 5 a.m. Neither early morning hours nor adverse weather deterred Missy, and after the birth of her children, she had taken up a job as a fitness instructor so that she could choose her own hours and have more time to spend with her kids. CCTV footage from the morning of April 18, 2016 shows Missy arriving at the church as planned and entering one of the rooms to set up. 5 a.m. rolled around and those attending the class began filling the hall, waiting to see what grueling exercises awaited them today. Instead of seeing Missy's bright, happy, smiling face, they were met with a much more horrific scene. Missy lay on the floor unresponsive, and it was clear that she had been attacked. But by who? Missy was well-loved within the community, and her friends and family testified that she had no known enemies. Everyone who knew Missy said that she was a bright and positive person who always tried to make everyone's lives better. The classgoers quickly called 911, and within minutes, the church was cordoned off and was considered an active crime scene. Unfortunately, Missy succumbed to her injuries, and now the investigation had taken a dark turn. The police recovered CCTV footage from the church and found a disturbing clue. At around 3.50 a.m., a person in what is described as police tactical clothing is seen entering the church using a back entrance. It's unlikely that Missy knew this person was here, as she went about her normal routine and set up for her 5 a.m. class. The mysterious person is seen walking down the halls, checking each room to see if there's anyone inside, pointing to the fact that this was a targeted attack and that Missy hadn't been the victim of opportunity. The motive of robbery was quickly ruled out, as nothing was missing from the church and none of Missy's personal items, such as her bag or phone, had been stolen. The biggest clue that police had to work with, and still have to this date, is the CCTV footage captured that morning. The footage was uploaded to YouTube in the hopes that someone might recognize the person, but the tactical police gear obscures their face and makes it difficult. Missy's husband, Brandon, was quickly ruled out as a person of interest, as he had a solid alibi for the morning of April 18th. With her husband now ruled out, the police began digging through Missy's social media accounts and found that she'd received a bizarre message on LinkedIn. While the message was creepy, this person has never been formally connected to Missy's case. Five years on, and the police are still investigating Missy's case, and they're no closer to uncovering the truth. There have been numerous people of interest, 
However, one by one, they've been ruled out, and now the police are asking for your help. If you have any information about Missy's case, you're urged to contact 972-775-3333. In 2013, a YouTube user by the name of Rainy Schuler uploaded a three-minute clip that has continued to baffle online sleuths to this day. The video, titled Security Cam Captures Strange Behavior, shows CCTV footage captured outside of Rainy's house in the Colorado mountains. According to Rainy, they live in a remote and isolated part of Colorado and they're still unsure how or why the woman was on their property. In the video, a woman appears from nowhere and can be seen walking around the wooded area acting very strangely. According to Rainey, the weather was cold and damp and the woman wasn't well dressed for the weather. As the video progresses, the woman's behavior becomes more and more bizarre as she walks around in a strange manner and appears to be in a trance-like state. At one point, she approaches Rainey's home, but less than a minute later, she's seen walking away back into the wooded area. The footage continues for another minute, with the woman pacing up and down once more. It's unknown whether Rainey contacted the authorities after they discovered this footage, and after they uploaded it to YouTube, it began gaining traction. Commenters on the video noted that the person appears to be under the influence or that they may be in a state of shock after being in a car accident. Others are much more suspicious of the person's motives and warn Rainey to be vigilant. Since 2013, there have been no updates from Rainey and the fate of the mysterious rain-walking woman is unknown. 24-year-old Jennifer Keys was aware of the dangers of our world. Her family and friends told the police that she was incredibly safety conscious and always kept in frequent contact with them to let them know that she was okay. Her parents had instilled safety tips into her from an early age, and they had no doubts that Jennifer could handle herself. But when she failed to turn up to her job at a timeshare company in Orlando, they knew that something was very wrong. On January 24, 2006, Jennifer failed to show up to her job in Orlando, Florida, which was extremely out of character. If she couldn't make it to work, she would always call and let them know. So when her office chair remained empty, her bosses and co-workers knew that something was amiss. Jennifer's boss called her parents to let them know what was going on, and when they also failed to get in contact with her, they drove to her apartment to make sure that everything was okay. As they entered the apartment, they found that nothing was out of place. Everything in her apartment indicated that she had gotten ready for work that morning and left as usual. So where was Jennifer? Her car was missing from the car park and phone records indicated that she had last used her phone at 10 p.m. the previous night. With no sign of Jennifer, her family called the Orlando Police Department and officially reported her missing. Within a matter of hours, a wide-scale search was organized, and volunteers along with the police began scouring the area. Days after Jennifer mysteriously disappeared, her car was found parked in the car park of another apartment complex, which only further puzzled the authorities. With this new evidence, the Orlando Police Department theorized that Jennifer hadn't left of her own volition and began digging into her personal life. The owner of the apartment complex handed over CCTV footage to the police, which showed an unknown person driving Jennifer's car into the apartment complex on the afternoon of January 24, 2006. Investigators were thrilled to finally have CCTV evidence. However, their joy soon turned to frustration. The gates of the apartment complex completely obscured the person's face, making it almost impossible to identify them. The CCTV cameras only captured images every three seconds instead of taking continuous footage. All investigations have been able to discern is that the person is between 5'3 and 5'5 and possibly male. Even with this chilling footage, the Orlando Police Department is still no closer to finding out what happened to Jennifer. January 24th, 2022 will be the 16th anniversary of Jennifer's disappearance. 
and the Orlando Police Department are appealing to anyone with information to come forward and contact them at 407-246-2121. When archaeologists started to excavate the floor of a building known as the Rock Cut Pool in the city of David in Jerusalem, they thought they just found a pile of trash. The trash itself was still incredibly important, dating back 2,900 years, and could provide insight into the lives of the people who lived there thousands of years ago. But some of the items that filled the space were much more interesting and have left experts with more questions than answers. The rock-cut pool was built during the Bronze Age. It's located near a spring and was built to help transport water from the spring to the city. After the Bronze Age collapse, the pool wasn't needed anymore, and eventually a house was built on top of it. The house dates back to the 8th century BCE, after the end of what's been called the Greek Dark Ages. It's an important period in history, due to the shift in power in the region. So, archaeologists are keen to find out what life was like for everyday citizens back then. The pool was filled with trash to form the floor of the house. The trash dates back to the end of the 9th century and seemed to be mostly food waste. There were lots of fish bones as well as broken seals, indicating that trash had been taken from an administrative building. But among the fish bones, archaeologists found a collection of about two dozen shark teeth. The shark teeth themselves were unusual, as sharks wouldn't fit into the typical diet of that time. But things only got stranger when experts examined the teeth. The teeth had belonged to a creature that had gone extinct 66 million years ago. Isotope examinations determined that these were actually shark tooth fossils that came from a site 80 kilometers away. Since then, other caches of shark tooth fossils have been found around Jerusalem but experts are no closer to figuring out what they were used for. There are no signs that they were used as tools or jewelry, and it seems the best explanation is that they had become collector's items. However, if this is the case, why dozens were disposed of as trash is another unanswered mystery. Of all the things in the night sky, comets might seem like the least interesting or unusual. These little balls of ice and dust orbit the sun and are known for their tails which stretch out behind them as gases and dust are pulled away from the main body. But even comets can have their mysteries and Comet 29P is possibly the most mysterious. Comet 29P is a relatively large comet that orbits the sun between Jupiter and Saturn. There are actually a lot of comet-like objects in this part of our solar system. They are known as centaurs and are generally larger than typical comets. They have a steady orbit, not getting closer to the sun, and not having the tails comets are known for. That is, until Jupiter's gravity knocks them out of their orbit and they are sent towards the sun. Comet 29P is still in its steady orbit, but that's not what makes this comet such a mysterious case. The object was discovered in 1927 and is 37 miles across, one of the largest comets we currently know of. It's also the most active in terms of eruptions. In fact, it's the second most active body in our solar system after Jupiter's moon. At apparently random intervals, Comet 29P will burst into life, erupting the contents of its interior onto the comet's surface. Usually, they're quite small, but occasionally these outbursts are much larger. At the end of September of 2021, one of these periods of large activity took place, attracting attention of amateur and professional astronomers. The comet shone 250 times more brightly than it usually did, looking like a star in the night sky. Because outbursts are so random and because astronomers prefer to focus on larger and more intriguing objects, professional observations of such outbursts are extremely rare. In September, a group of scientists tried to use the Hubble telescope to observe the outburst, but the telescope had a technical glitch and wouldn't come back online until after the outburst was over. Scientists still don't know what's causing the activity on Comet 29P. Usually, it's heat from the sun that causes any activity on a comet, but that doesn't explain this object's random outbursts. Figuring out what's going on on this unique object could teach us more about how comets move beyond the orbit of Pluto 
and into the inner solar system. But for now, the comet is quiet again and isn't sharing any of its secrets. The Havering Horde was one of the largest Bronze Age hordes found in England when it was discovered in East London in September of 2018. Since being unearthed, experts have been able to examine the hundreds of objects that were buried in four separate caches thousands of years ago. But there are still more questions that need to be answered. The hoard was discovered by expert archaeologists who've been surveying an area before gravel quarrying was set to take place. It's known that a number of Bronze Age settlements were believed to have existed in the area. So a team was given time to make sure the work wouldn't be destroying anything valuable. A survey from above pinpointed some places to look and the team began digging. It was on a Friday evening that they hit upon what they thought was about 130 bronze objects behind what had once been a round house. When work began the following week, they discovered this was just a quarter of the hoard. Four separate groups of objects were discovered in pits around the house. They had all been buried at about the same time, sometime between 900 and 800 BCE. At the time, the area would have been a marshy forest on the edge of the River Thames, and experts believe that it would have been a popular spot to start a community. In total, 453 items were found, and the complete hoard weighed about 45 kilograms. Most of that weight came from copper ingots that would have come from the continent. Many of the other items are believed to have come from the continent and other parts of Britain, suggesting the Havering community participated in a lot of trading. Among the items were broken weaponry, spear and axe heads, armlets and bracelets, and metal working tools. Castoffs and droplets of metal that were too valuable to be thrown away were also found in the hoard. Why the items were buried in such a way has left experts confused. The items weren't created for ceremonial purposes. The weapons and tools all have signs of use. They were all deliberately buried, with evidence of packing straw around some of the items. So it wasn't as if the objects were lost to time. Despite ongoing studies, the reason behind the hoard remains a mystery. Estimated to be around 25,000 years ago, early modern humans were struggling to survive as the world around them got colder and colder. They were in the middle of an ice age that wouldn't reach its peak for around 3,000 years. Most humans in Europe and Western Asia lived hunter-gatherer lifestyles, never staying in one place for too long. But recently, researchers have discovered man-made structures in Western Russia that seem to go against everything we know about the time. The most amazing and baffling of these structures is Kostenki 11, which has earned the nickname Bonehenge. Circles of mammoth bones have been found across Eastern Europe by archaeologists. Rather than bones sticking out of the ground to resemble Stonehenge, the structures were more like walls made up of bones. Most of these structures are just a few meters in diameter and date back to 20,000 BC, but Kostenki 11 is a unique example. Kostenki 11 is an archaeological site near the Don River, between the modern-day villages of Kostenki and Borshevo. It was discovered in 2014, and it's not only the oldest structure of its kind found so far, it's also the largest. Rather than a few meters, it's 40 meters in diameter. Experts believe that it's unlikely this served as a permanent dwelling place for those who built it. Not only were these people typically nomadic, roofing such a structure would have been impossible without support beams that don't seem to exist. However, it was definitely a massive undertaking. The remains of at least 60 mammoths have been found here, and moving the remains of these animals wouldn't have been an easy task. Experts believe the circle is too perfect for it to have just been a dumping ground for food waste, and believe that the structure was definitely significant in some way. Unlike other smaller rings, the remains of other animals haven't been found at Kostenki 11. Usually, the remains of reindeer or foxes are found, which are another indication of a more permanent human habitation. One possibility put forward by experts was that this place had some spiritual or ceremonial purpose. It's believed that there was a water source year-round that would have attracted both animals and man. It's possible the structure was built to symbolize the importance of the site to those struggling to survive the challenging temperatures. 
Research at the site is still ongoing, but for now, the reason why Ancient Man put so much effort into making this remains a mystery. The universe is filled with mysterious objects, many of which experts are still trying to understand. The most obvious of these is dark matter, which is believed to make up most of matter in the universe but cannot be detected. But there are some things in the universe that can be detected, and experts are still left baffled by what they might be. In 2020, researchers in Australia detected something extremely unusual coming from the center of our galaxy. The Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder Variables is a collection of radio telescopes that peer into the center of the Milky Way. It detected radio wave signals coming from an object just 4 degrees away from the galactic center. There are all sorts of objects that emit radio waves. Radio waves are actually part of the same electromagnetic spectrum as visible light and gamma rays but with a much lower frequency. In places like the center of the galaxy, which is filled with lots of dust and developing stars, low frequency waves are some of the only ones that can penetrate the clouds and reach Earth. So it's not uncommon for objects emitting radio waves to be detected. What is strange is the patterns that the object was emitting. Over the course of nine months, six signals were detected from the object. According to one researcher, it started out invisible became bright, faded away, then reappeared. Another said that it seemed to turn on and off like a light switch. The signals would last for weeks, but when traditional telescopes were pointed at that area of space, nothing was detected. A more powerful telescope in South Africa was also used to try to confirm the sighting. It would look at that portion of space for 15 minutes every few weeks. Because the other signals had lasted weeks, researchers thought this would be enough to catch it if it started emitting radio waves again. However, when the South African telescope finally caught one of the signals, the signal disappeared in a single day. Because of the short time, researchers didn't learn anything new about the source. The strange radio wave patterns don't match waves detected from any other celestial body scientists know about. Everything from pulsars to supernova were considered, but it doesn't appear that the mysterious object is any of these. It does seem to be similar to what scientists call galactic center radio transients, but it still doesn't match perfectly, and these objects are also extremely mysterious. The object might be something never before seen, but it's unlikely scientists will be able to say for certain until a new generation of telescopes are built in the coming decades. 23-year-old Heather Teague had her whole life in front of her. The well-liked and kind young woman was looking to the future and wondering what life had in store for her. Sadly, that was taken away from her and her case is now one of the scariest cold cases in Kentucky history. On August 26, 1995, Heather jumped into her car and drove to Newburgh Beach in Henderson County, Kentucky. The beach is situated along the Ohio River, and Heather wanted to make the most of the good weather while she waited for her boyfriend to arrive. She dressed in her red plaid swimming costume, grabbed a towel, tanning oil, and other essentials and headed down to the beach, not knowing that in a matter of hours she would mysteriously vanish. As she sunbathed and relaxed, Heather was approached by an unknown white man who threatened her. He then grabbed her by the hair, dragging her off into the woods. Disturbingly, the entire event was witnessed by a man who was looking through his telescope at the beach and shorelines. This man watched in horror as the unknown man came out of the woods, approached Heather, and took her away. It took the man 45 minutes to call the police, and when he did finally call them, they arrived at the scene within minutes and a search for the missing 23-year-old began. The witness was able to describe the man, telling police that he was a white male, about 6 feet tall, and 210 to 230 pounds with brown hair and a bushy beard. He also told the police that the suspect was wearing jeans, no shirt, a wig, and a mosquito net. The details bewildered investigators, and they began to explore every possibility. During the search for Heather, investigators found part of her swimming costume not far from where she had been sunbathing. 
When Heather's disappearance hit the headlines, a local farmer came forward and told investigators that he'd captured Heather's car and a red and white Ford Bronco on CCTV that day. Days later, a man by the name of Marvin Ray Dill was stopped as part of a routine traffic stop. And inside his truck, a red and white Ford Bronco, authorities found weapons and hair that resembled Heather's. Dill was now on investigators' radar, and after receiving tips, they began to investigate him further. Sadly, Dill took his own life shortly after Heather's disappearance, once he learned that the police were investigating him. He's never been officially connected to Heather's case, but investigators do consider him as a suspect. Since 1995, there have been few updates in Heather's case, and her whereabouts remain unknown to this day. Christopher J. Bello has also been considered a suspect in Heather's case. However, the Kentucky State Police don't have enough evidence to conclusively link him to the case. Heather Teague was last seen on August 26, 1995, and is described as a white female with brown hair, green eyes, 5'2", and weighing between 90 and 110 pounds. Heather has scoliosis, which is noticeable, and anyone with information is asked to contact the Kentucky State Police at 270-826-3312. Quoting case number 1695-1327. 38-year-old Marsha Ray was a loving mother of two and worked as a nurse at the Harrogate District Hospital in Harrogate, North Yorkshire. Life for the Rays was going well. Marsha and her husband, Colin, had steady, stable jobs, and their two children were growing up into happy and well-adjusted children. January 24, 1997, started like any other day for the Rays. Marsha got her two children ready for school and dropped them off at Hookstone Chase Primary just before the school day started. Little did the teachers at Hookstone Chase or Marsha's children know that this would be the last time she would ever be seen. Almost 25 years later, Marsha's case remains unsolved and her family are still fighting for justice. According to Colin, Marsha told him that she would be gone for a few days. But when she failed to return after this time had passed, he knew that something was wrong. Marsha was reported missing to the North Yorkshire police, who opened an investigation and quickly began searching for her. It didn't take long for the North Yorkshire police to find their first clue, Marsha's car. Her car had been abandoned in Leeds, approximately 14 miles away from her home in Harrogate. During their investigation, the North Yorkshire police also learned that her car, a red Metro, had been spotted at Nid Gorge, around six miles away from her home. Had Marcia driven her car to Nid Gorge and then Leeds, or had someone moved it? After this, there's been no sign of Marcia and no new evidence has come to light despite extensive searches and investigations into her disappearance. The home that she shared with her husband and two children was thoroughly searched as well. Marsha's case quickly went cold, and 25 years later, her family and the North Yorkshire police are appealing for anyone with information to come forward. In 2013, Marsha's case was transferred to the newly created Major Crime Unit who hoped to shed new light on her case. Unfortunately, the new unit was unable to unearth any new evidence, and her case remains unsolved. The North Yorkshire police are asking anyone with information to contact them at 101 if you're in the UK, or 441904-618-691 if you're abroad. Alternatively, you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously at 088 555-111. 20-year-old Carla Elizabeth Luzzi was described as a kind and generous person who would do anything to help her family and friends. In 2002, she was working at El Grotto's Bar in Columbus, Ohio as a dancer and was trying to get her life together and move forward. On New Year's Eve, Carla left her home at around 7 p.m. to go to work at El Grotto's Bar. Wondering what kind of night would be ahead of her, 
On New Year's Eve, Carla left her home at around 7 p.m. to go to work at El Grotto's bar. In the early hours of December 31st, 2002, Carla left the bar with an unidentified African-American man, and this was the last time she was ever seen or heard from. There have been no traces of Carla since December 31st, and it's almost as if she dropped off the face of the earth. Her family reported her missing, and the Columbus police opened an investigation and began searching for her. 19 years later, that investigation is still open, and the Columbus police are still no closer to finding out what happened to Carla. Carla's sister, Mandy Connor, has never given up hope and regularly canvasses the area where her sister was last seen, handing out missing person posters and asking locals if they saw anything that evening. The Columbus police are working closely with Carla's family in the search for her, and on the 12th anniversary, they helped hand out missing person posters close to the bar where she was last seen. Unfortunately, no new leads have been established, and the investigation is right where it was in 2003. Investigators believe that she may have tried to hitchhike to Richmond, Virginia, or New York on the day of her disappearance, as her boyfriend had recently moved to New York. Carla Luzzi was last seen on January 1st, 2003, leaving the El Grotto Bar in the 2300 block of West Broad Street in Columbus. She's of Yugoslavian descent with brown hair, brown eyes, and is 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 6 and 140 pounds. Carla has a mole on the right side of her lip, a mole beneath her right eye, a 3 inch scar on her forehead, a scar on her arm, and a round scar on her left hand. She also has her ears and tongue pierced and was last seen wearing all black clothing and a black leather jacket. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Robin B. Tucker of the Columbus Division of Police at 614-645-4545, quoting case number 251301. In November of 2007, Barbara Fleischmann had recently been diagnosed with breast cancer and was worried about upcoming operations and treatments. Her son, 24-year-old Kyle Fleischmann, hated seeing his mother worried and upset, and decided that on November 8th, he would take her, his sister, and decided that on November 8th, he would take her, his sister Noel, and his friend Dan to a comedy show at their local theater to lift everyone's spirits. This was just the kind of person that Kyle was. He always put others first and always wanted to help other people. Once the show had finished, Noel and Barbara headed back home while Kyle and Dan hit the bars in Charlotte, North Carolina. The two ended up at the Buckhead Saloon, where they had a few drinks and socialized with other patrons at the bar. At around 1 a.m., Dan left, but Kyle wasn't quite ready to leave. So Kyle told Dan that he would come and pick up his car in the morning. The two said their goodbyes, and this was the last time that Dan ever saw his friend. When Dan awoke the next morning and saw that Kyle's car was still there, he got an uneasy feeling in his stomach. He decided to wait for a while, hoping that Kyle would arrive to collect his car, but he never did. A few hours passed, and after realizing that Kyle wasn't coming, he called Kyle's parents and asked them if they had seen him. His parents were horrified to hear that Kyle hadn't collected his car. They tried to call his phone, but they went straight to voicemail. His parents knew that this was extremely out of character for their responsible son. Their worst fears were confirmed when his workplace called to let them know that he hadn't shown up for work. Kyle's parents called the Charlotte Mecklenburg police and reported their son missing. During their investigation, police received a tip from a taxi driver who reported seeing a man fitting Kyle's description walking down North Davidson Street at around 3.25 a.m. CCTV from the Buckhead Saloon showed Kyle leaving at around 2.20 a.m. and going to the Fuel Pizza place where he ordered two slices of pizza. After this, Kyle is never seen again. The last activity on his phone was at 3.30 a.m. when he tried to call his sister Noelle and his roommate, and it's unknown why he was calling them. 
After 3.30 a.m., his phone was either turned off or ran out of battery and hasn't been used since. He also left his card at the bar in order to pay his tab, but it's believed that he had his wallet, car keys, and small change with him when he left the bar. Reports also note that he left his coat behind at the bar and that the temperature that night was around one degree Celsius. Extensive searches were carried out, but no sign of Kyle has ever been found. His family haven't given up hope, and they're hoping that the right person with the right information comes forward to help them solve the case. Kyle Fleischman was last seen on November 9, 2011, leaving the Buckhead Saloon. He's described as a white male with brown hair and green eyes, six feet tall and 180 pounds. Kyle has porcelain upper veneers and was last seen wearing jeans, a dark shirt, and black dress shoes. Anyone with information is asked to contact homicide detective David Osorio of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department at 704-336-4978. Quoting case number 2008-1109. 201-500. 19-year-old Christine Marie Easton had recently graduated from Sunset High School in Hayward, California, and was looking forward to the future. She was described as a sensible young woman who loved the theater and was very caring towards those around her. In January of 1971, this responsible young woman vanished into thin air. And almost 51 years later, the FBI is still looking into her creepy cold case. On January 18, 1971, Christine went shopping in Hayward, California, buying a pair of boots and then dropping her friend off at her home. Christine had borrowed her ex-boyfriend's blue 1969 Ford Maverick, promising him that she would take it to the car wash and bring it back sparkling. After Christine dropped her friend off, she headed to Charlie's Car Wash at 25400 Mission Boulevard. This was the last sighting of Christine, and after this, she mysteriously vanished. The alarm was raised when Christine failed to return the car to her ex-boyfriend. Andy notified her family that something was wrong. Christine was reported missing, and during the search for her, her ex-boyfriend's car was discovered abandoned at Charlie's Car Wash. The doors were locked, her handbag was inside, and the car's paperwork was scattered across the floor on the driver's side, which immediately struck the officers as strange. Aside from the paperwork, there was no sign of a struggle and no sign of Christine. The police quickly found themselves at a dead end. With no leads and no witnesses, her case ran cold, but her family and the local community never forgot about her. Her ex-boyfriend was questioned and was eliminated as a suspect. In 2009, a new witness came forward, claiming that she had seen Christine being bundled into a van on January 18, 1971 by two men. She was able to provide details of one of the men and also claimed that the van she was thrown into had distinctive side mirrors. Despite this new information, Christine's case remains cold and the Hayward Police Department and the FBI are still actively investigating her disappearance. Christine was last seen on January 18, 1971, and is described as a white female with blonde hair, blue eyes, and is 5 foot 7 and 110 pounds. She has a scar on her forehead and a surgical scar on her abdomen. She was last seen wearing a black and brown leather coat, black boots, blue slacks, a red, white, and blue pinstripe tunic, and a bluish gold scarf. Anyone with information is asked to contact Detective Jen Kell of the Hayward Police Department at 510-293-7000, quoting case number 1971-1-1297, or call your local FBI office. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.